Now, uh, my first guest came to our attention back in 2013 when he tweeted a breathtaking shot of Ireland from the International Space Station. Then he captured the imagination of the world when he made a video of David Bowie's Space Odyssey. He's recently taken to writing children's books. Will you please welcome Ireland's favourite astronaut, Commander Chris Hadfield. <laughs> You've been in space. You've been I in space. Three, three in times. Three times. Fact, three times. Listen, yeah. congratulations on the book. It's a children's book, your Thank latest you. one. Uh, it's called uh, The Darkest Dark. And it's I guess called the, the Darkest Dark. Sorry, The yeah, Darkest yeah, Dark. Yeah, the Darkest it, Dark. It gets the thumbs up from Tom Darcy, age oh, four. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's sort of oddly for a children's book. It's, it's nearly autobiographical, isn't it? Well, uh, when... It's interesting writing a children's book, actually. You'd think it'd be simple, right? But in order to tell a story that is uh, worth reading again, that's memorable, that will not just be for one specific age, but maybe as the child gets older, put some different ideas. So, so we thought we would base it not just on an idea, but sort of on a real person. So you get to get the link between the fantasy of childhood and then the reality of what that means for you in life. And then dealing with fear. Also, how do you deal with fear in life? It's okay to be afraid. How do you find a way to be brave? And so, uh, so that's the way we put it together. Two lovely artists, the Fan Brothers, and uh, the book has done superbly well. I've been really pleased. And Chris is the main character, obviously, being you. Yeah. And, and as a nine, <laughs> yeah. ten-year-old, you were afraid of the dark. And it's well, a bit were you? Like, it's were a, you afraid of the dark? I can't remember being afraid of the dark, but what's happening in our house happened in your house. Ah. You used to go up to your mum and dad's bed in the middle of the night. Well, I, th I think that's pretty common for a lot of parents. You know, when a little one is learning, they get out of the crib with the big walls and eventually get into their own bed and, and just all the unknown possibilities of the world, mm. sometimes they, they, they creep up on you. And, and then the shadows. And I grew up in an old farmhouse with the wind blowing and the whole house sort of creaking. And I could imagine all sorts of terrible things. And, and this, the real key, this of particular course, night, this particular night. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. So they were saying, as we all do as parents, we bribe. So they were saying, <laughs> now, Chris, age 9 or 10, if you stay in your bed tonight, you can go to the neighbours tomorrow to watch what? Uh, I, that was the summer of 1969 when the very first two people walked on the moon. And I'd been reading about it and dreaming about it, and we didn't have a television, but our neighbour did. And, uh, and so, yeah, to, to sleep in my own bed and then to be able to go over the next night and stay up late to watch Neil and Buzz come down and land and get out and walk on the surface of the moon. It was just... It, it was bigger than a dream at the time. It was almost unbelievable, and yet it was kind of the start of, of so many things that I changed in my own life as a result. Yeah, and that, that moment is, it was pivotal, wasn't it, for you? Well, I think it was pivotal for a lot of people. The number of people that pursued PhDs in America has never been that high. It, it inspired people to do things with their lives uh, that, that were far outstripping the event itself. And for me, it, it was, even though I was Canadian, we didn't have astronauts, I just thought, wow, that's possible? And it kind of, I felt it was like someone opening a door and saying, this type of thing can happen in your life. Mm. And that's what we tried to capture in the book as well, to let people see that impossible things can happen uh, as a result of your dreams. Um, you're very popular with children because, you know, everybody is, is curious about space, but children in particular. And I know you do loads of tours to schools all over the world. I do. And I'm, I'm sure every school in the country would love to have you, and they can't. But what we did was we sent our cameras out to St. Uh, Catherine's Church of Ireland uh, oh, School great. in Dublin. And we said, Chris is coming in. We're very excited. I said, and if you had him, what question would you ask? So uh, we have a few questions from them. Alexandra is age nine, and Olivia is aged eight. Uh, and take it away, girls. How do you feel when the countdown goes for five, four, three, two, one... Blast off! Blast <laughs> off! Actually, we don't we don't say blast off. No, uh, what? That's very disappointing. <laughs> we don't even have a countdown in the cockpit. No, that's that's outside. Right. Where, um, I think probably the big difference is uh, the ship doesn't fly itself, and so inside you are as focused and aware as a group of people can possibly be because that ship is going to do its best to kill you and, and you have to focus and concentrate and be ready to recognize everything that can happen and how you need to do the things you need to do so quickly. So it's almost like the hardest test you've ever written 
you know, the, the, the toughest exam where you, you just, you've studied and studied and now you're just ready to scribble down all the answers. You're not even so much nervous as you are just, just supremely ready for it. It's, it's a wonderful day in the life. And at what moment do you know it's all worked? Is there, is there a moment? When the engine shut off, it takes about nine minutes. You never count on it right until then because so many things can happen. And if you go to space for half a year, 50% uh, of all your risk is in the first nine minutes. Six months in space, and yet half of all your risk is in those first nine minutes. So you are as, as, uh, as focused as, as any person can possibly be. So that's really what you're thinking about. But as soon as the engine shut off and you're suddenly weightless and in space, then there's this big smile comes over your face and you realize we've done it, we're here. Uh, thanks to Alexander and Olivia for that question, good question. Quiva is up next, she's age eight. Quiva, what's your question? If you needed to go to pee or poo in space, where would you go and how would you do it? And would it float up into your face and has it ever, have you ever smelt it? <laughs> Let's, let's stop. You don't, have to, right there. You don't yeah. have to answer the last question. We so, I, it, yeah. so I think let's use Ray as a model uh, you don't here. Have to. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you assume a certain posture on the toilet. And, and on Earth, uh, Quiva, Ray, you both uh, count on gravity. In space, we count on airflow. We have air pulled down into the toilet so that nothing floats up into your face. Okay. And in fact, uh, it was surprised me, but on the space station, because the ventilation system is so good, in fact, there was never any smell from anybody. Right. I was really surprised. It was the best toilet I've ever used anywhere. Here's so an, I recommend it. it right. Uh, thanks, Queen, for that. Here's an adult version of, the, of that question. Do we not need gravity to help our digestive system? And when it, you don't have it, does that affect it? Uh, it? It actually changes the interaction between what you've eaten and the walls of, of your intestines and things. So it does change things slightly. Also, you lose your skeleton. So there's a different uptake of how your body is digesting things. But really, it's not gravity driven. You can, you can drink and eat standing on your head and okay. your body will still work. Okay. Um, but you can't burp. You can't belch in space because the gas and the liquid and solid are all mixed. So, uh, so that you can't burp the whole time that you're up there. If you do, you, you sort of throw It begs up. the question. Yeah, well, it's... Um, you can. Yeah, yeah, there's more of that. More of that, okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mohammed, age eight, uh, has a question for you. Mohammed? Chris, if you ever met an alien, would it, you would give him his, your guitar? If I ever met an alien, would I give him my guitar? If he wanted it, sure. Why not? <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I wonder if he'd like a, a five, a six string, or what? You know, what uh, what would an alien like? Depends how many fingers the alien had, I guess. <laughs> but let me just—we have not met any aliens. We're looking. We're looking on Mars. We're looking on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. We're looking at other stars. We've seen almost five thousand planets around other stars. We haven't found life anywhere yet, but we're looking. And what do you think? Is there? There's an unlimited number of planets, essentially. The numbers are so big, it's essentially unlimited. But the distances and, and times are huge, so it's a big area to search. We, we've only just begun looking, and uh, so far we haven't found anything. The odds are good, but until you find something, you never know. Uh, thanks to Mohammed for that question, and thanks to all the pupils there in St. Catharines. Give them yeah, a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, I was doing the maths on it. So you, you dreamt about space travel for about 25 years, and then you yeah. your first launch in 1995. Yes. And you're up there. And can you remember when you looked back down at Earth and you saw that green-blue thing? How, how did you feel? Is, is that a moment? Is, is that a moment? If, when you go into a really special place, like maybe one of the biggest churches in the world, or into maybe some gigantic natural cavern of a cave or something, there's a, there's a certain feeling comes over me, sort of like a, a hushed feeling of awe and wonder and, and humility. And that's how you feel looking at the world the whole time. And if, there, if the two of us were at the window of the spaceship, it's, it's funny, we would talk in, in sort of hushed tones together, like you would in a, in a great big cathedral. That same sort of feeling of wonder and privilege it's and that, seeing... That specific. Well, that's that specific. what you would, you would say, wow, look, look at that, look behind you. And it's yeah. just, it's, it's yeah. so gloriously gorgeous, much richer and more, uh, uh, more powerfully visual than you would expect. And you go around the world every 92 minutes, so you see the whole... I've been around the world 2,600-odd times. You get to know the You're planet. You're just boasting now, Chris. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's just... It's, it, it, it gives you both an appreciation and a reverence that never goes away. That's, yeah, because the next question I want to ask you is, does it profoundly change you when you see that and you've been in space? 
Uh, I think if they just if they just grabbed uh, one of the trad musicians, uh, <laughs> Al, if we grabbed you out of the audience and uh, and plucked you on a space station and took you around the world once and sat you back down, it would be very difficult to integrate with the rest of your life. But when you train for it for 25 years, as I did, you slowly incrementally um, get a little readier for it. And I spoke with, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and, and Gene uh, Cernan who just passed away mm. and all those other guys to get ready for it. And so even, it didn't de decrease the marvel of it. It just helped me, I think, maybe get more ready for it. So it wasn't some big epiphany or schism in my life. It was more like a, an appreciated richness to my life. And you mentioned the word humility there. Does it make you more humble because you oh, realize so. how vast everything is? Yeah, and how old the world is. How small and how, we are. <laughs> well, we're, we're huge, of course, in our own minds. Mm. And, and I, I am, that's, that's all I am, you know. And so to me, I'm important. But at the same time, I see the perspective of the number of people and time and distance. And, and so it also, I think it actually makes you optimistic. You know, you feel part of something that is so much bigger and, and longer lasting than you may have imagined. So yeah, it definitely is. A, there's a lasting humility that comes mm. from it. Uh, 34 million people have watched your version of David Bowie's Space Odyssey. Have really? Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Wow. Do you want to watch a little bit of it again? Yeah, yeah. Hey, man. Uh, uh, nice. What did the late David Bowie make of that? He loved it. I was in New York last week. There's a traveling, uh, honoring David Bowie thing, and they asked me to come down, and I, I played and sang with them in New York last week with all of his musicians. He, loved, he was nothing but a gentleman to me. He, he loved that version of it. He wrote that when he was like 19 or 20, and he always wanted to fly in space. And to see his song performed there uh, just in the last couple of years before he passed away, it just... It, that was the best part for me, was it delighted him, put a big smile on his face. So I'd, I, uh, I wish I'd gotten to know him better. I have nothing but respect. And it's fascinating that he wrote that before man had even walked on the moon. He wrote that in 68, yeah, 69, when he was just, just coming out of his teens. And he and Rick Wakeman played it together. And, uh, and it, was, it was panned at first. People just thought it was kind of silly. But when I played it in orbit, you, I could see just what a creative imaginer of, of an artist he was because it somehow fit that place yeah. that didn't even exist when, when he wrote that song. Yeah, it, 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 that's the reason I ended up recording it because I could almost hear what he meant when I sang the words up on Space Station. It surprised Very me. Very special. Yeah. Uh, when you announced that you're coming on the show, we got a huge reaction. Everybody wanted to meet you, particularly children. Uh, obviously, everyone couldn't, so we ran a little bit of a competition. Great. Thanks to everybody who entered. But the winners you're about to meet now are uh, Emily Hickey and Joshua Gordon. Give them a round of applause. You can, yeah, that's, that's Chris, Chris Hadfield. It's very nice to meet you, Bob. He's Commander Chris Hadfield, Joshua. I wish I'd known. I would have worn my space suit. <laughs> <It's> lovely. <laughs> so, do you want to find out stuff about Emily and Joshua, Chris? Very, very much so. Where did you get your, your space suit? Uh, my mom bought it. Your mom bought it. All right. It's good. That's, that's how I got my first space suit also. <laughs> and Emily, how old are you? I'm 10 years old. You're 10 years old. This, that book that Ray was talking about, the summer that I decided to be an astronaut, I just, just turning 10, same age you are right now, I started thinking about what I might be when I grew up and what, what opportunities there might be and what I might want to change in the world. Yeah. And uh, what, do you, what do you think about maybe you might want to change in the world? Have you ever thought about it, what you might want to do? Um, yeah. I just, I'd love to be an astronaut. Ah. Ah, well, that's nice I'd to hear. I'd love to be the first female astronaut in Ireland. Oh, that'd be good for you. That's good. Josh, Joshua, what age are you? Six. You're right. Yeah. Why do you want to go into space, do you think? Because it just looks so cool. And I've been watching your experiment with the cloth thingy where the water sticks to your hands. Yeah. I went on Google. Yeah. Did you enjoy that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's really weird when you ring. I was wearing this watch. You want to see it? What, that's, is that a special one that you get? Yeah, yeah. It's, if you look on the back, it says it's certified for space flight. Look at and that. And when I was wringing out that cloth, the water, instead of falling to the floor, was crawling up my arms and, and crawling over that watch, in fact. So, yeah, it's, I'm glad you watched that video and enjoyed it. Chris, Joshua's gran 
promised that she'd bring Joshua into space. Why is that, Joshua? Because um, she got a rocket cake for her birthday. Oh. Yeah. Was it good? Yeah. Yeah. And I have one funny question that she likes about your mustache. Ah. No, she... <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. She's a crush on you. <laughs> You, you obviously want to be an astronaut as well. That's yes, obvious. I do. But yes, I you do. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do these two remind you of you as a as a nine, ten year old? I, I'm not sure I had their confidence actually, <laughs> but yeah, very, very much so. I think at at about their age, it's where you start to become aware of things beyond the home and beyond uh, the school, and start to think about the fact that someday you're going to grow up and and be something, and and what type of person that you want to be. Not necessarily what you want to do, but what type of person do you want to be when you grow up? And it's nice to see that in both of you also. And what advice would you have for Emily and Joshua, Chris? Uh, when somebody asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead, think about what is it about the world that you think needs changing? What about the world do you think should be better or could be better? And think about how you can be somebody to change that. Well, how can you change yourself to maybe do something that's important to you? That's how I always looked at it. You, you can't change the world, but you can change yourself into somebody else. And that's, that's how I always tried to decide what to do next. Right. Uh, listen, lads, uh, Commander Chris Hatfield has signed a copy of his book for both of you. Uh, and uh, this one's, that's yours, Joshua. There you go. And Emily, that one's for you as well. And listen, Joshua and Emily, thanks for staying up late for us. Uh, you were brilliant. And ladies and gentlemen, Commander Chris Hatfield. Thank you, Thank you very much. Very nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Very nice to meet you both. Thank you.